Good morning. I told Josh that the first time I, I told him part of the story, the first time I had an opportunity to preach, I was in college. Um, before I even moved to Oklahoma, and um, it was to a, a, I was part of a, a, a praise and worship team, and when I signed up, it was to, it was like a small singing group and and everything, and then I said, "Hey, Curtis, um, we've got some time. Part of this thing that we're doing. Um, why don't you speak?" And I was like, "Okay." Um, so I prepared and prepared, and during that um, sermon, I think it lasted about six and a half minutes, um, and I had to go through my three points four times, um, just to stretch it out that long, and mixed in there I had a baseball analogy that completely went south, um, because I don't know anything about baseball, and I really shouldn't have been talking about baseball. Um, but it fit the sermon, or so I thought at the time. Um, so. Anyway, um, I've had a few, a few opportunities since then, um, but when the pastor asked me to, to speak um, a few weeks ago, um, I said, you know, pastor, it's been a long time since I've been the, behind the pulpit in any other capacity other than, you know, working with the children's ministry or doing something along that line. And he said, it's okay. It's like riding a bike down a very long, steep hill. Um, that's, that's what the pastor told me. And I, I just said, that wasn't very encouraging. <laughs> um, so hopefully we won't um, careen out of control or anything like that. Um, I, I've been thinking about um, the theme of fruit within the Bible for, for a long time. In fact, a, a really long time. Um, when I was in, um, in high school, um, when um, I start my, my Christian life started to become more active, more personal, um, and I started reading the Bible on my own, I came across repeatedly this trees and fruit thing, just over and over and over again, especially in the Gospels. And so I started circling it. Um, in fact, we have that Bible still. It's pretty beaten, tattered, torn. I bought it um, for eleven ninety five um, at the um, Bible bookstore um, to take on backpacking trips because I was big into backpacking when I was in high school and you can in that Bible you can see the circles of you know trees and fruit trees and fruit trees and fruit um, because I I've, I've always learned that if somebody repeats something <clears throat> it's important and if you see a theme over and over again pay attention I try and teach this to my kids if somebody says something once okay pay attention if somebody says something twice, three times, you really got to focus on why are they repeating this. Um, so the theme of fruit is repeated um, within Scripture. Um, we've got stories within the, the Old Testament of the fruit of the land and harvest, these themes. Um, and as I mentioned the gospel, we've got trees and fruit. We've got parables about fruit. Um, we talk about the fruits of our labors, um, fruit of the Spirit. Uh, we'll look at that passage in a little while. Um, Jesus even curses a tree for not bearing fruit. So fruit, it's important. Um, last week's sermon, um, as I was preparing for this, and pastor started mentioning, um, closing up his, his sermon, um, the last passage, the last verse in his sermon, was talking about fruit, and I was like, oh no, he's going to talk about fruit, and I'm, I'm not going to have anything to talk about next Sunday. Um, but actually, it was, it, was, it was God working. It was a great lead-in, um, because he talked about um, how in, in the parable of the sower, or the parable of the soils, the pastor's been calling it, um, that as the seed is, is thrown out and spread, that it'll it'll fall on good soil and grow up and bear much fruit. But sometimes also um, it'll it'll um, be on ground that'll choke it out, and it's unfruitful. So the theme is there, and um, he didn't know it, but he set me up to start talking about about fruit this week. So 
our outline um, for this Sunday and next Sunday um, is going to be fruit. First, why is it an understanding of fruit important? Why, why do we care? And we started into that a little bit. And what then is fruit? When we talk about fruit in the Bible, what is it? How do we bear fruit? Are we fruit producers? Are we distributors of fruit? What are we in this equation? And the last question will be, are you a producer? Um, the advantage of having two Sundays out of you know, 52 weeks in the year of, of, to preach is you can pick anything. The disadvantage is you can pick anything. Um, and since I'm not going through a long study, we're not going through a book, um, it ended up being kind of a, a word study for me. Um, electronic Bibles are cool because you can type in fruit and you'll get, you know, 600 lists of passages of fruit. Um, and so we'll be looking at a lot of scriptures this morning um, and next week as we talk about some of these things. But first, um, fruit, our, our a definition of fruit. Fruit is a noun, often attributive. Usually a sweet food, such as a blueberry, orange, or apple that grows on a tree or bush. Second definition, the part of a plant that has the seeds in it, such as the pod of a pea, a nut, a grain, or a berry. Um, and actually that's come up in our conversation dinner time often. Is this a fruit or is it a vegetable? Because you think of tomato, vegetable, but it's a fruit. Third definition, a result or a reward that comes from some action or activity. With this definition, Scripture uses all three of these definitions. Sometimes it's talking about physical fruit, as we see in passages in the Old Testament, as they stored up the grains and, and fruit of the fields for, to, for eating later. And we see the sower in the parable talking about the seeds. But also, as most of you know, and as, as Josh mentioned, there are rewards or results of the activities in lives or circumstances that bear fruit. And so, the, using this definition, we're not just always talking about a metaphors, but we're talking about results that come from um, a work or an activity. So, our passage first this morning is from Luke 6, 43 through 45. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit, for figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Now, it stands to reason we know from, I mean, just, I mean, living um, that a good tree will produce good fruit and a bad tree will produce bad fruit. You would expect walking up to a beautiful, healthy plant, um, if it's in season, to be able to, to look at it and examine it and, and find good, healthy fruit growing on it. And likewise, if you saw a, a tree or a tomato plant, we used to grow tomato plants, um, and if you, you know, some would be doing flourishing, doing great, and some would have, um, you know, who knows, uh, some caterpillar overnight could have consumed half of it. But if you'd walk up to it, and if it had holes in the leaves and it was drooping over, you would look at it and you might find fruit on it, but you would expect it not to, to be red and ready and, and, um, and healthy. So we would expect this understanding of, as Jesus teaches, that good trees bear good fruit. In fact, he goes to, almost to the, the extreme of, it's not possible 
for a sick plant to produce anything else but for fruit. Um, but in verse 44, he also helps us to see, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes picked from a bramble bush. So the fruit helps us to identify the plant. Um, I grew up in, in southern Idaho. I think I may have said that when, um, when we gave our little testimony time a couple years ago. Um, Caleb and I drove to, to southern Idaho for my grandfather's funeral last year. And as we we're driving by, driving through this, um, Caleb had never been in southern Idaho before, at least in memorable time when, you know, except when he was a little tiny, maybe driving across. And, um, you know, southern Idaho, if you don't know, is very fertile farmland, except that it's a desert, so you have to irrigate it. Um, once you, my dad used to say, if you spit on the ground, it'll turn green in southern Idaho. But you do, you have to get it wet. And so irrigation is a big thing. And so we're driving through southern Idaho, and um, Caleb was asking me, you know, what this plant was and that plant was. Well, I grew up in southern Idaho, but I wasn't a farmer. I, you know, I was a small town, but city kid. Um, and I, have, I had friends in high school that were farmers and could tell you a, a sugar beet plant from a potato plant from um, green peas to corn. I can tell corn. Um, once it gets tall. Um, but until I would see the fruit of whatever those plants were, I would have no idea what kind of plant it was. I, I, and, and unless you're a farmer, honestly, unless you deal with these things day in, day out, I planted peas in this field and I planted potatoes in that field, you know, they sprout up. Green leaves to me look like green leaves. But once you start looking at the fruit that, are, that they produce, hey, I'm sharp enough. I can figure some of those things out. I can tell, well, a potato from a, uh, I have to dig it up, a potato from a sugar beet. Um, now technically those are probably tubers, so I don't know where that fits into the fruit category. Um, but do you see my point? If you were to walk through a orchard in winter, can you tell an apple tree from a pear tree from a peach tree? When those things are blooming, when they're producing fruit, it's easy to tell the difference between an apple tree and a peach tree. But until those things, until, until you see the fruit of that tree, you can't know. You don't know. So, for each tree is known by its fruit. It's how we recognize plants. And as we, we're going to find out, it's one of the ways we can identify who our, our God is. Therefore, going back to our part of our, our, um, our definition, we, we have to um, examine the fruit to understand and to identify its source. We wouldn't um, expect to find bananas coming from mango trees or anything else. Um, now, an aside, I didn't put this in this passage. Um, verse 37 of this passage talks about judge and, not be, and you shall not be judged. It also has the passage where you need to take the, the two by four out of your own eye and um, before you examine your brother, if you're familiar with the passage. Um, Oftentimes those come out of context. We get all excited about not judging others. And then I've heard many people get tongue in cheek say we need to be fruit inspectors of, of people. Um, I, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind um, that yes, we need to, to look at fruit. We need to be, examine fruit. Um, but we also need to be conscious and very aware of, of the source of it. Um, but before we go there, um, a parallel passage in Matthew 7, um, chapter 7, verse 15 through 
says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will re recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or fig figs from thistles? This is the companion passage in Matthew. So every tr healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. This gives an expansion, a little bit more detail what Jesus was saying in that par this, this passage. Um, because he takes it from just talking about fruit to a direct metaphor about false prophets. Beware of the false prophets who come in sheep's clothing. It helps us to be certain that Jesus wasn't talking about just physical fruit. And we know that, but this removes any question that he wasn't just giving us a botany lesson in this. He clearly takes this to the false teachers so that we can identify who, the, who they are. They may look and act pretty, but upon examination of their fruit, the results of their labor, we can know them and we can know what is going on inwardly inside them. We also know from Matthew chapter 12 verse 33 that it's what's inside us that bears fruit. When Jesus responded to the Pharisees when they said that he was casting out demons with the power of the devil in verse Matthew chapter 12 verse 33 he said Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasures brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Again, he's identifying the source by the fruit and the fruit comes from within, inside. Uh, simply outside appearances don't tell us the whole story. Um, you remember what God, or what Jesus had called the Pharisees. He said, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So Jesus, even Jesus, could look on the inside, but looked at the fruits of, of those. So our last passage to talk about why it's important, um, why we need a good understanding of fruit, is found in John 15, 8 and 9. And we're going to read this passage next, but um, the whole thing, um, or chapter in part, uh, yeah, sorry. We're going to read most of chapter 15, verse 1 through 11. But just this one passage. By this my Father is glorified, verse 8, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. And I had to put this in. Why is it important that we need to understand what fruit is? Because right there is essential. If we know that God can be glorified by the fruit it's important. We need to have that in our, in our thinking as we understand the importance of it. So, an understanding of fruit and why it's important. It's because how, it's how producers are recognized. How fruit, or how trees are identified, how plants are identified, how um, disciples, people are identified and recognized. It helps us to identify truth versus false teachers. And we know what is in on the inside that it, what is what bears fruit. And the fruit of our lives glorifies God and identifies us as his, or can and should. So, what is fruit? What then is fruit? First, before we answer that question, we're going to get there. Um, Let's look at where it comes from. John chapter 15, 1 through 11. I promised. Um, I am the true vine, 
and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it might bear more fruit. Already you are clean because the word that I have spoken to you abide in me and I in you, and the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be my and it will be done, to, done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Books have been written on this passage. Sermons um, have been written on this passage. Uh, uh, back in, I, I had some notes as I was looking through um, my own notes. Um, the pastor's friend, um, Conrad Mbewe, uh, was here back in March 2012 and preached on this passage. Though he read it, he preached on one word in this passage, abide. And I, all my notes, I'd love to summarize, but the core of it was, he said to abide with Jesus is that Jesus takes residence in your soul. His life flows through you. And that, that stuck with me um, as, I was, as I was looking at this, because Jesus lays out the structure of this vine and producing fruit, that Jesus is the, the structure for the whole plant that, that we're built upon. Each one of us is attached to him, abides in him. He is the foundation. He's the, 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 main, the main vine. Um, I, I understood this a little, a little bit more um, because we had this, this it wasn't grapes. It, was, it had little grape-like fruit in our house in Shawnee. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, Jill. Um, but our back fence had this little vine that was growing up. And for the first few years, it was just chaotic, crazy. Um, and I, I, I started trimming it back. And then the next season, I started pushing it into places in the fence. And so as it would grow, it would grow into the fence and along the back because it was a chain link fence and it would have been nice to have a privacy fence there. Well, this passage calls God, God is the vine dresser in verse, um, the last half of verse one, Father, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And I didn't understand, I'm, you know, I don't, didn't grow, grapes when I was a kid. I didn't um, have a vineyard or anything like that. So I didn't, I didn't get this. But as I saw this, this vine that we had in this, in, on our back fence, with a little bit of work and a little bit of, of time, you can push these vines as they grow and they will just spread out further and further instead of making this big bush and be a bundle of, of mess. You can actually make a privacy fence out of a chain link fence um, and grow it out um, healthily instead of having all these dead branches and, and, and such. So as Jesus talks about this, he lays himself out as the structure that things are built on, but he, he shows God as the vine dresser that prunes, trims, guides, structures the growth, pushes, um, pushes the vines in the right direction. And he talks about you and I, how we're supposed to abide in him. We're supposed to stay connected. 
We're supposed to recognize our dependence upon him. We're supposed to understand that we cannot bear fruit alone. We can't do this. Um, there were a couple of other plants in that area um, that I was building up this, um, this vine, and some of them were just plain weeds. And if you cut them off at the base, you know this, everything else dies upstream. With Christ as our base, as our foundation, as the root system, the, the stock of the vine, we can stay connected. In verse 8, by this, I told you I was going to come back to this, verse 8, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. God is glorified when we bear fruit, and that you... And we are identified as his. Verse 10 says that we are part of this vine abiding with Christ to keep his commandments. Um, this, as I was studying this, reading this, um, wasn't part of my original notes. But if you're on YouTube or if you're on um, Facebook at all in the past three or four days, um, you probably saw a video by... Um, Joel Osteen's um, um, wife. Uh, I don't know if, if you saw this, but um, she made the comment very publicly that when we do good for God, we're not really doing it for God. We're doing it for our own self and for our own happiness because that's what God wants is our happiness, most of all. And obviously within the the conservative Christian community, everybody's just been, well, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard, if not worse, the most blasphemous thing I've ever heard. And this, as I was reading through the sermon again, um, I realized that this right here talks about it. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Doing good, my actions, not for me. It's so that I might be obedient to God to glorify him. Now the end of that passage, verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. Christ no doubt wants us to be joyful, not happy all the time necessarily. We're not going to be, everything's not going to be roses and gumdrops. But the joy that abiding in him, being a part of him, yes, he wants us to be part of that. But I couldn't leave that um, just there. The truth is that we keep God's commandments. We abide with Christ so that we might glorify him, not so that we can be happy, but that joy will come when we embrace Jesus, glorify him, and keep our, his commandments not doing it just for our own self. So, finally, what are fruits? What are the fruits? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 help us to point in the right direction. If Christ is the vine and God is the vine dresser and we are attached to him for a purpose, Ephesians 2, 8 gives us this purpose. For grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And, not, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, that we should walk in them. A very familiar passage, but this tells us why this is important and where these good works, this fruit of the Christian life comes from. We are saved by faith for the purpose of to glorify God and walk with him doing good works prepared by him. James 1, the James 1 passage we read with um, for our congregational reading, verse 18 says it of of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth 
that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The first fruit that we will see in the Christian life is that of salvation. We don't often think of it as a fruit, but as the Holy Spirit enters our lives. The fruit of that, the result of that, is our salvation. It's the, the changing of our, our lives. The activity of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives and the source of all good fruits. Our, um, our London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is the, the statement of faith that our, our bylaws are all written on. Um, I debated on reading this, but honestly, I don't, I, mean, I think we need to read, I think we need to read more of the London Baptist Confession of Faith because it really ties down our, our doctrine. Um, I want to, I'll read it, but I'll, I'll focus on one, one little section. The London Baptist Confession of Faith, um, chapter 14, section 2. By this faith, the faith that comes through the Holy Spirit, the saving faith, by this faith, a Christian believeth to be true whatsoever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself, and also apprehendeth the excellency therein above all other writings and all other things in the world, as it bears forth the glory and his attributes, the ex excellency of Christ in the nature of his offices, and the power and fullness of the Holy Spirit in the workings and operations, and so is enabled to cast his soul upon this truth thus believed. So, I know that's a lot of um, King James type language. Um, we depend upon the word as Christians to point us in the right direction. We take the word and it gives us the information that we need. That's why we study. That's why we follow it. The section, second portion. And also this word and this faith acteth differently upon that which each particular passage thereof contains, yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings, and embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. But the principal acts of saving faith have immediate relation to Christ, accepting, receiving, and resting upon him alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. This helps us, hopefully, to see a little bit better the big pa package that is given to us with um, this faith and salvation that it has an effect, and that's what I wanted to, to highlight. It gives us, it acts differently upon each particular passage, the word that we give, the, the word that we have. Yielding obedience, a fruit, to the commands, a trembling at the threatenings. We feel the warnings, we see the warnings, and embracing the promises of God for li the life that is which to come. It gives us a desire to obey God's commands. It helps us tremble. The fruit, fruit of repentance, is the next one that I wanted to talk about just briefly. John the Baptist preaching the gospel um, of repentance in Matthew. As many were coming, he says, it says, but when he saw the many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Repentance is a change in direction, not just a feeling sad or sorry, but a reversal of your, your intents. The Pharisees came repenting of their sin, but John didn't believe their repentance. He didn't believe that they were sincere in that repentance. And certainly we know from passages elsewhere that they didn't understand their sin. They didn't see their sin for sin. And we see that throughout Scripture. But John says, let me see the fruit. Let me see the change in your life of the repentance that you're, showing, you're saying now. And let me see that repentance as the outpouring of the change that's going on. <clears throat> 
So, we have seen where this fruit comes from. The first fruit, salvation, repentance, and then the one you've been waiting for, fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 20 through 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Love is a true love that outpours from the believer. Not self-serving, but radical, sacrificial love for others. A giving without getting. Peace, a contentment with your circumstances, dependence upon the vine, the vine that you're connected to, abiding with Christ and how he puts things in perspective, patience, long-suffering is a perseverance, a sticking with the task at hand and a focus. A steadfastness, endurance to the poor treatment that we see in this world. A kindness, looking to meet the needs of others, an empathy, and caring for others that overflows from how you have been shown grace and mercy yourself. Goodness, a reflection of the righteousness of God understanding, practicing, and expressing God's character. Faithfulness, expressing integrity and your dependence upon God for his provision and a devotion to your Savior. Gentleness, forgiving, correcting with kindness and meekness, a power under control and self-control, allowing ourselves to be controlled by the Holy Spirit instead of giving in to all of our own sinful and fleshly desires, giving up daily to his desires, to God's, God's direction. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, These outpour as fruit effects of what's going on inside. And the last one for this morning, um, the fruit of the gospel. The proclamation and the discipleship of others. As, as the pastor has been going through the parable of the soils and I was relating fruit and seeds because fruit produces seeds. Um, I was thinking through this, what is the purpose of sowing seed? It's to grow trees, plants that are going to what? Produce fruit that produce more seed. It's, it's a cycle, and we've been talking about this cycle of discipleship um, for years now within our congregation. And as I, 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 maybe this is, everybody else is going, well, yeah, of course, Curtis. But it was a revelation to me that you know, we, we see seed scattered, but it grows up and it grows into a, a flourishing plant if nurtured and discipled properly. And fruit will, will, all this fruit that we've been talking about will come out of that life. But ultimately, that fruit is a seed bearer again. And that seed needs to be planted and, um, and grow up again. So it's a cycle that we need to be part of. Let's be ready, um, as Jesus says this um, in Matthew 7, 35 to, and 38, to all of us. And Jesus went throughout the cities and villages, teaching their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction 
When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. We need to find out, and this is what we're gonna start talking about next week, um, is where are you in this cycle of fruit bearing? Um, are you bearing fruit? Are you still a little plant that nobody can identify in the ground? Um, and then, are we producers or just merely consumers of the fruit? So I, I hope, I pray, Lord willing, we'll all be back here next week um, to continue on and, and, and see where we are in this cycle. Would you pray with me?